Philis Treatises, Tusculum Disputations By Cicero Audiobook 14x15 Their minds being tainted by pernicious opinions, they are ready to bear any torture rather than hurt an ibis, a snake, a cat, a dog, or a crocodile, and should anyone inadvertently have hurt any of these animals, he will submit to any punishment. I am speaking of men only. As to the beasts, do they not bear cold and hunger, running about in woods, and on mountains and deserts? Will they not fight for their young ones till they are wounded? Are they afraid of any attacks or blows? I mention not what the ambitious will suffer for honor's sake, or those who are desirous of praise on account of glory, or lovers to gratify their lust. Life is full of such instances. XXVIII. But let us not dwell too much on these questions, but rather let us return to our subject. I say, and say again, that happiness will submit even to be tormented, and that in pursuit of justice and temperance and still more especially and principally fortitude, and greatness of soul, and patience, it will not stop short at sight of the executioner, and when all other virtues proceed calmly to the torture, that one will never halt, as I said, on the outside and threshold of the prison, for what can be baser, what can carry a worse appearance, than to be left alone, separated from those beautiful attendants? Not, however, that this is by any means possible, for neither can the virtues hold together without happiness, nor happiness without the virtues, so that they will not suffer her to desert them, but will carry her along with them, to whatever torments, to whatever pain they are led. For it is the peculiar quality of a wise man to do nothing that he may repent of, nothing against his inclination, but always to act nobly, with constancy, gravity, and honesty, to depend on nothing as certainty, to wonder at nothing, when it falls out, as if it appeared strange and unexpected to him, to be independent of every one, and abide by his own opinion. For my part, I cannot form an idea of anything happier than this. The conclusion of the Stoics is indeed easy, for since they are persuaded that the end of good is to live agreeably to nature, and to be consistent with that as a wise man should do so, not only because it is his duty, but because it is in his power it must, of course, follow that whoever has the chief good in his power has his happiness so too. And thus the life of a wise man is always happy. You have here what I think may be confidently said of a happy life, and as things now stand, very truly also, unless you can advance something better. XXIX. A. Indeed I cannot, but I should be glad to prevail on you, unless it is troublesome, as you are under no confinement from obligations to any particular sect, but gather from all of them whatever strikes you most as having the appearance of probability, as you just now seemed to advise the Peripatetics and the Old Academy boldly to speak out without reserve that wise men are always the happiest I should be glad to hear how you think it consistent for them to say so, when you have said so much. Against that opinion, and the conclusions of the Stoics. M. I will make use, then, of that liberty which no one has the privilege of using in philosophy but those of our school, whose discourses determine nothing, but take in everything leaving them unsupported by the authority of any particular person, to be judged of by others, according to their weight. And as you seem desirous of knowing how it is that, notwithstanding the different opinions of philosophers with regard to the ends of goods, virtue has still sufficient security for the effecting of a happy life which security, as we are informed, Carnides used indeed to dispute against, but he disputed as against the Stoics whose opinions he combated with great zeal and vehemence. I, however, shall handle the question with more temper, for if the Stoics have rightly settled the ends of goods, the affair is at an end, for a wise man must necessarily be always happy. But let us examine, if we can, the particular opinions of the others, that so this excellent decision, if I may so call it, in favor of a happy life, 
may be agreeable to the opinions and discipline of all. Triple X. These, then, are the opinions, as I think, that are held and defended the first four are simple ones. That nothing is good but what is honest, according to the Stoics, nothing good but pleasure, as Epicurus maintains, nothing good but a freedom from pain, as Hieronymus asserts, nothing good but an enjoyment of the principle, or all, or the greatest goods of nature as Carnides maintained against the Stoics these are simple, the others are mixed propositions. Then there are three kinds of goods. The greatest being those of the mind, the next best those of the body, the third are external goods, as the peripatetics call them, and the old academics differ very little from them. Dinomachus and Kalipo have coupled pleasure with honesty, but Diodorus the peripatetic has joined indolence to honesty. These are the opinions that have some footing, for those of Aristo, Pyro, Herolus, and of some others, are quite out of date. Now let us see what weight these men have in them, excepting the Stoics, whose opinion I think I have sufficiently defended, and indeed I have explained what the Peripatetics have to say, excepting that Theophrastus, and those who followed him, dread and abhor pain in too weak a manner. The others may go on to exaggerate the gravity and dignity of virtue, as usual, and then, after they have extolled it to the skies, with the usual extravagance of good orators, it is easy to reduce the other topics to nothing by comparison, and to hold them up to contempt. They who think that praise deserves to be sought after, even at the expense of pain, are not at liberty to deny those men to be happy who have obtained it. Though they may be under some evils, yet this name of happy has a very wide application. XXXI For even as trading is said to be lucrative, and farming advantageous, not because the one never meets with any loss, nor the other with any damage from the inclemency of the weather, but because they succeed in general, so life may be properly called happy, not from its being entirely made up of good things but because it abounds with these to a great and considerable degree. By this way of reasoning, then, a happy life may attend virtue even to the moment of execution, nay, may descend with her into Phalaris's bull, according to Aristotle, Xenocrates, Spusippus, Polemon, and will not be gained over by any allurements to forsake her. Of the same opinion will Caliphon and Diodorus be for they are both of them such friends to virtue as to think that all things should be discarded and far removed that are incompatible with it. The rest seem to be more hampered with these doctrines, but yet they get clear of them, such as Epicurus, Hieronymus, and whoever else thinks it worthwhile to defend the deserted Carnides. For there is not one of them who does not think the mind to be judge of those goods, and able sufficiently to instruct him how to despise what has the appearance only of good or evil. For what seems to you to be the case with Epicurus is the case also with Hieronymus and Carnides, and, indeed, with all the rest of them, for who is there who is not sufficiently prepared against death and pain? I will begin, with your leave, with him whom we call soft and voluptuous. What? Does he seem? to you to be afraid of death or pain when he calls the day of his death happy, and who, when he is afflicted by the greatest pains, silences them all by recollecting arguments of his own discovering? And this is not done in such a manner as to give room for imagining that he talks thus wildly from some sudden impulse, but his opinion of death is, that on the dissolution of the animal all sense is lost, and what is deprived of sense is, as he thinks what we have no concern at all with. And as to pain, too, he has certain rules to follow then. If it be great, the comfort is that it must be short, if it be of long continuance, then it must be supportable. What, then? Do those grandiloquent gentlemen state anything better than Epicurus in opposition to these two things which distress us the most? And as to other things, do not Epicurus and the rest of the philosophers seem sufficiently prepared? Who is there who does not dread poverty? And yet no true philosopher ever can dread it. XXXII 
but with how little is this man himself satisfied? No one has said more on frugality. For when a man is far removed from those things which occasion a desire of money, from love, ambition, or other daily extravagance, why should he be fond of money, or concern himself at all about it? Could the Scythian Anatrasis disregard money, and shall not our philosophers be able to do so? We are informed of an epistle of his in these words. Anatrasis to Hanno, greeting. My clothing is the same as that with which the Scythians cover themselves, the hardness of my feet supplies the want of shoes, the ground is my bed, hunger my sauce, my food milk, cheese, and flesh. So you may come to me as to a man in want of nothing. But as to those presents you take so much pleasure in, you may dispose of them to your own citizens, or to the immortal gods. And almost all philosophers, of all schools, excepting those who are warped from right reason by a vicious disposition, might have been of this same opinion. Socrates, when on one occasion he saw a great quantity of gold and silver carried in a procession, cried out, How many things are there which I do not want? Xenocrates, when some ambassadors from Alexander had brought him fifty talents, which was a very large sum of money in those times, especially at Athens, carried the ambassadors to sup in the academy, and placed just a sufficiency before them, without any apparatus. When they asked him, the next day, to whom he wished the money which they had for him to be paid. What? said he, did you not perceive by our slight repast of yesterday that I had no occasion for money? But when he perceived that they were somewhat dejected, he accepted of thirty minas, that he might not seem to treat with disrespect the king's generosity. But Diogenes took a greater liberty, like a cynic, when Alexander asked him if he wanted anything. Just at present, said he, I wish that you would stand a little out of the line between me and the sun, for Alexander was hindering him from sunning himself. And, indeed, this very man used to maintain how much he surpassed the Persian king in his manner of life and fortune, for that he himself was in want of nothing, while the other never had enough, and that he had no inclination for those pleasures of which the other could never get enough to satisfy himself, and that the other could never obtain his. XXXIII. You see, I imagine, how Epicurus has divided his kinds of desires, not very acutely perhaps, but yet usefully. Saying that they are partly natural and necessary, partly natural, but not necessary, partly neither. That those which are necessary may be supplied almost for nothing, for that the things which nature requires are easily obtained. As to the second kind of desires, his opinion is that any one may easily either enjoy or go without them. And with regard to the third, since they are utterly frivolous, being neither allied to necessity nor nature, he thinks that they should be entirely rooted out. On this topic a great many arguments are adduced by the Epicureans, and those pleasures which they do not despise in a body, they disparage one by one, and seem rather for lessening the number of them, for as to wanton pleasures, on which subject they say a great deal, these, say they, are easy, common, and within any one's reach, and they think that if nature requires them, they are not to be estimated by birth, condition, or rank, but by shape, age, and person. And that it is by no means difficult to refrain from them, should health, duty, or reputation require it, but that pleasures of this kind may be desirable, where they are attended with no inconvenience, but can never be of any use and the assertions which Epicurus makes with respect to the whole of pleasure are such as show his opinion to be that pleasure is always desirable, and to be pursued merely because it is pleasure, and for the same reason pain is to be avoided, because it is pain. So that a wise man will always adopt such a system of counterbalancing as to do himself the justice to avoid pleasure, should pain ensue from it in too great a proportion, and will submit to pain provided the effects of it are to produce a greater pleasure. So that all pleasurable things, though the corporeal senses are the judges of them, 
are still to be referred to the mind, on which account the body rejoices while it perceives a present pleasure, but that the mind not only perceives the present as well as the body, but foresees it while it is coming, and even when it is past will not let it quite slip away. So that a wise man enjoys a continual series of pleasures, uniting the expectation of future pleasure to the recollection of what he has already tasted. The like notions are applied by them to high living, and the magnificence and expensiveness of entertainments are deprecated, because nature is satisfied at a small expense. XXXIV For who does not see this, that an appetite is the best sauce? When Darius, in his flight from the enemy, had drunk some water which was muddy and tainted with dead bodies, he declared that he had never drunk anything more pleasant, the fact was, that he had never drunk before when he was thirsty. Nor had Ptolemy ever eaten when he was hungry, for as he was travelling over Egypt, his company not keeping up with him, he had some coarse bread presented him in a cottage, upon which he said, nothing ever seemed to him pleasanter than that bread. They relate, too, of Socrates, that, once when he was walking very fast till the evening, on his being asked why he did so, his reply was that he was purchasing an appetite by walking, that he might sup the better. And do we not see what the Lacedaemonians provide in their Phidicia? Where the tyrant Dionysius supped, but told them he did not at all like that black broth, which was their principal dish, on which he who dressed it said, it was no wonder, for it wanted seasoning. Dionysius asked what that seasoning was, to which it was replied, fatigue in hunting, sweating, a race on the banks of Eurytas, hunger and thirst, for these are the seasonings to the Lacedaemonian banquets. And this may not only be conceived from the custom of men, but from the beasts, who are satisfied with anything that is thrown before them, provided it is not unnatural, and they seek no farther. Some entire cities, taught by custom, delight in parsimony, as I said but just now of the Lacedaemonians. Xenophon has given an account of the Persian diet, who never, as he saith, use anything but cresses with their bread, not but that, should nature require anything more agreeable, many things might be easily supplied by the ground, and plants in great abundance, and of incomparable sweetness. Add to this strength and health, as the consequence of this abstemious way of living. Now, compare with this those who sweat and belch, being crammed with eating, like fatted oxen, then will you perceive that they who pursue pleasure most attain at least, and that the pleasure of eating lies not in satiety, but appetite. XXXV They report of Timotheus, a famous man at Athens, and the head of the city, that having supped with Plato, and being extremely delighted with his entertainment, on seeing him the next day, he said, Your suppers are not only agreeable while I partake of them, but the next day also. Besides, the understanding is impaired when we are full with overeating and drinking. There is an excellent epistle of Plato to Dion's relations, in which there occurs as nearly as possible these words. When I came there, that happy life so much talked of, devoted to Italian and Syracusan entertainments, was no ways agreeable to me, to be crammed twice a day, and never to have the night to yourself, and the other things which are the accompaniments of this kind of life, by which a man will never be made the wiser, but will be rendered much less temperate, for it must be an extraordinary disposition that can be temperate in such circumstances. How, then, can a life be pleasant without prudence and temperance? Hence you discover the mistake of Sardanapalus, the wealthiest king of the Assyrians, who ordered it to be engraved on his tomb, I still have what in food I did exhaust, but what I left, though excellent, is lost. What less than this, says Aristotle, could be inscribed on the tomb, not of a king, but an ox. He said that he possessed those things when dead, which, in his lifetime, he could have no longer than while he was enjoying them. Why, then, are riches desired? 
and wherein doth poverty prevent us from being happy? In the want, I imagine, of statues, pictures, and diversions. But if any one is delighted with these things, have not the poor people the enjoyment of them more than they who are the owners of them in the greatest abundance? For we have great numbers of them displayed publicly in our city. And whatever store of them private people have, they cannot have a great number, and they but seldom see them, only when they go to their country seats, and some of them must be stung to the heart when they consider how they came by them. The day would fail me, should I be inclined to defend the cause of poverty. The thing is manifest, and nature daily informs us how few things there are, and how trifling they are, of which she really stands in need. XXXVI. Let us inquire, then, if obscurity, the want of power, or even the being unpopular, can prevent a wise man from being happy. Observe if popular favor, and this glory which they are so fond of, be not attended with more uneasiness than pleasure. Our friend Demosthenes was certainly very weak in declaring himself pleased with the whisper of a woman who was carrying water, as is the custom in Greece and who whispered to another, that is he that is Demosthenes. What could be weaker than this? And yet what an orator he was! But although he had learned to speak to others, he had conversed but little with himself. We may perceive, therefore, that popular glory is not desirable of itself, nor is obscurity to be dreaded. I came to Athens, saith Democritus, and there was no one there that knew me this was a moderate and grave man who could glory in his obscurity. Shall musicians compose their tunes to their own tastes? And shall a philosopher, master of a much better art, seek to ascertain, not what is most true, but what will please the people? Can anything be more absurd than to despise the vulgar as mere unpolished mechanics, taken singly? and to think them of consequence when collected into a body? These wise men would contemn our ambitious pursuits and our vanities, and would reject all the honors which the people could voluntarily offer to them, but we know not how to despise them till we begin to repent of having accepted them. There is an anecdote related by Heraclitus, the natural philosopher, of Hermodorus, the chief of the Ephesians, that he said that all the Ephesians ought to be punished with death for saying, when they had expelled Hermodorus out of their city, that they would have no one among them better than another, but that if there were any such, he might go elsewhere to some other people. Is not this the case with the people everywhere? Do they not hate every virtue that distinguishes itself? What? Was not Aristides, I had rather instance in the Greeks than ourselves, banished his country for being eminently just? What troubles, then, are they free from who have no connection whatever with the people? What is more agreeable than a learned retirement? I speak of that learning which makes us acquainted with the boundless extent of nature and the universe, and which even while we remain in this world discovers to us both heaven, earth, and sea. XXXVII. If, then, Honor and riches have no value, what is there else to be afraid of? Banishment, I suppose, which is looked on as the greatest evil. Now, if the evil of banishment proceeds not from ourselves, but from the froward disposition of the people, I have just now declared how contemptible it is. But if to leave one's country be miserable, the provinces are full of miserable men, very few of the settlers in which ever return to their country again. But exiles are deprived of their property. What, then? Has there not been enough said on bearing poverty? But with regard to banishment, if we examine the nature of things, not the ignominy of the name, how little does it differ from constant travelling? In which some of the most famous philosophers have spent their whole life, as Xenocrates, Crantor, Arcilus, Lacides, Aristotle, Theophrastus, Zeno, Cleanthes, Chrysippus, Antipater, Carnides, Panadius, Cletomachus, Philo, Antiochus, Posidonius, and innumerable others, who from their first setting out never returned home again. Now, 
what ignominy can a wise man be affected with, for it is of such a one that I am speaking, who can be guilty of nothing which deserves it. For there is no occasion to comfort one who is banished for his deserts. Lastly, they can easily reconcile themselves to every accident who measure all their objects and pursuits in life by the standard of pleasure, so that in whatever place that is supplied, there they may live happily. Thus what Tuser said may be applied to every case. Wherever I am happy is my country. Socrates, indeed, when he was asked where he belonged to, replied, the world, for he looked upon himself as a citizen and inhabitant of the whole world. How was it with T. Altibudius? Did he not follow his philosophical studies with the greatest satisfaction at Athens, although he was banished? Which, however, would not have happened to him if he had obeyed the laws of Epicurus and lived peaceably in the Republic. In what was Epicurus happier, living in his own country, than Metrodorus, who lived at Athens? Or did Plato's happiness exceed that of Xenocrates, or Polemo, or Arsilas? Or is that city to be valued much that banishes all her good and wise men? Demaratus, the father of our king Tarquin, not being able to bear the tyrant Sipsilus, fled from Corinth to Tarquinii, settled there, and had children. Was it, then, an unwise act in him to prefer the liberty of banishment to slavery at home? XXXVIII Besides the emotions of the mind, all griefs and anxieties are assuaged by forgetting them, and turning our thoughts to pleasure. Therefore, it was not without reason that Epicurus presumed to say that a wise man abounds with good things, because he may always have his pleasures, from whence it follows, as he thinks, that that point is gained which is the subject of our present inquiry, that a wise man is always happy. What? Though he should be deprived of the senses of seeing and hearing? Yes, for he holds those things very cheap. For, in the first place, what are the pleasures of which we are deprived by that dreadful thing, blindness? For though they allow other pleasures to be confined to the senses, yet the things which are perceived by the sight do not depend wholly on the pleasure the eyes receive, as is the case when we taste, smell, touch, or hear, for, in respect of all these senses, the organs themselves are the seat of pleasure, but it is not so with the eyes. For it is the mind which is entertained by what we see, but the mind may be entertained in many ways, even though we could not see at all. I am speaking of a learned and a wise man, with whom to think is to live. But thinking in the case of a wise man does not altogether require the use of his eyes in his investigations, for if night does not strip him of his happiness, why should blindness, which resembles night, have that effect? For the reply of Antipater the Cyrenaic to some women who bewailed his being blind, though it is a little too obscene, is not without its significance. What do you mean? Seth he, do you think the night can furnish no pleasure? And we find by his magistracies and his actions that old Apias, too, who was blind for many years, was not prevented from doing whatever was required of him with respect either to the Republic or his own affairs. It is said that C. Drusus's house was crowded with clients. When they whose business it was could not see how to conduct themselves, they applied to a blind guide. XXXIX When I was a boy, C.N. Aufidius, a blind man, who had served the office of praetor, not only gave his opinion in the Senate, and was ready to assist his friends, but wrote a Greek history, and had a considerable acquaintance with literature. Diodorus the Stoic was blind, and lived many years at my house. He, indeed, which is scarcely credible, besides applying himself more than usual to philosophy, and playing on the flute, agreeably to the custom of the Pythagoreans, and having books read to him night and day, in all which he did not want eyes, contrived to teach geometry, which, one would think, could hardly be done without the assistance of eyes, 
telling his scholars how and where to draw every line. They relate of Asclepiades, a native of Eritrea, and no obscure philosopher, when someone asked him what inconvenience he suffered from his blindness, that his reply was, he was at the expense of another servant. So that, as the most extreme poverty may be borne if you please, as is daily the case with some in Greece, so blindness may easily be borne, provided you have the support of good health in other respects. Democritus was so blind he could not distinguish white from black, but he knew the difference between good and evil, just and unjust, honorable and base, the useful and useless, great and small. Thus one may live happily without distinguishing colors, but without acquainting yourself with things, you cannot, and this man was of opinion that the intense application of the mind was taken off by the objects that presented themselves to the eye, and while others often could not see what was before their feet, he traveled through all infinity. It is reported also that Homer was blind, but we observe his painting as well as his poetry. What country, what coast, what part of Greece, what military attacks, what dispositions of battle, what array, what ship, what motions of men and animals, can be mentioned which he has not described in such a manner as to enable us to see what he could not see himself. What, then? Can we imagine that Homer, or any other learned man, has ever been in want of pleasure and entertainment for his mind? Were it not so, would Anaxagoras, or this very Democritus, have left their estates and patrimonies, and given themselves up to the pursuit of acquiring this divine pleasure? It is thus that the poets who have represented Tiresias the augur as a wise man and blind never exhibit him as bewailing his blindness. And Homer, too, after he had described Polyphemus as a monster and a wild man, represents him talking with his ram, and speaking of his good fortune, inasmuch as he could go wherever he pleased and touch what he would. And so far he was right, for that Cyclops was a being of not much more understanding than his ram. XL. Now, as to the evil of being deaf. M. Crassus was a little thick of hearing, but it was more uneasiness to him that he heard himself ill spoken of, though, in my opinion, he did not deserve it. Our Epicureans cannot understand Greek, nor the Greeks Latin. Now, they are deaf reciprocally as to each other's language, and we are all truly deaf with regard to those innumerable languages which we do not understand. They do not hear the voice of the harper, but, then, they do not hear the grating of a saw when it is setting, or the grunting of a hog when his throat is being cut, nor the roaring of the sea when they are desirous of rest. And if they should chance to be fond of singing, they ought, in the first place, to consider that many wise men lived happily before music was discovered, besides, they may have more pleasure in reading verses than in hearing them sung. Then, as I before referred the blind to the pleasures of hearing, so I may the deaf to the pleasures of sight. Moreover, whoever can converse with himself doth not need the conversation of another. But suppose all these misfortunes to meet in one person. Suppose him blind and deaf let him be afflicted with the sharpest pains of body, which, in the first place, generally of themselves make an end of him, still, should they continue so long, and the pain be so exquisite, that we should be unable to assign any reason for our being so afflicted still, why, good gods! Should we be under any difficulty? for there is a retreat at hand. Death is that retreat a shelter where we shall forever be insensible. Theodorus said to Lysimachus, who threatened him with death, It is a great matter, indeed, for you to have acquired the power of a Spanish fly. When Persis entreated Paulus not to lead him in triumph, that is a matter which you have in your own power, said Paulus. I said many things about death in our first day's disputation, when death was the subject, and not a little the next day, when I treated of pain, which things if you recollect, there can be no danger of your looking upon death as undesirable, or, at least, it will not be dreadful. 
That custom which is common among the Grecians at their banquets should, in my opinion, be observed in life. Drink, say they, or leave the company, and rightly enough, for a guest should either enjoy the pleasure of drinking with others, or else not stay till he meets with affronts from those that are in liquor. Thus, those injuries of fortune which you cannot bear you should flee from. XLI. This is the very same which is said by Epicurus and Hieronymus. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.